In this installment, I catch up with a few fall comedies, including the premiere of 9JKL and the return of Bob's Burgers and Superstore. I report on my efforts to create a homemade DVD set of Legion, and I make some decent progress on my current collection. Finally, I both in theory and in practice reject the wisdom of the crowd. Stay tuned, you'll want to find out how. Welcome to the show! He doesn't have that on video, does he? We'll find out together on video for the year. Before I dig into it here, the biggest comedy I have to comment on is Jeremy Piven in Wisdom of the Crowd, which it's a departure for this project, but I think it's worth making my Friday Night Feature. Friday Night Feature! The show poses a crowdsourcing, crime-fighting app called Sophie, which, through a failure of cross-platform connectivity in an CBS all-access reality, does not appear to be available for download anywhere. If it were, I probably wouldn't download it anyway, because it would probably just update through the week with reminders to tune in on Sunday nights. The app is in service to Silicon Valley tech giant Jeffrey Tanner, played by Jeremy Piven, fresh from the acting school of Kevin Spacey. His insanely sympathetic teenage daughter was murdered, and the police would appear to have arrested the wrong man, processed through the courts and serving time. Not a sympathetic character as presented, but most of us are offended by someone serving time for crimes they didn't commit. Flash forward to the launch of this free app by which users send information they think could break the case for a chance to win $100 million. Why not just $10,000? I mean, people send in videos of their friends getting schmucked in the nuts for $10,000 in this country. Then updates users with fresh information when Sophie Central, or whatever it's called, vets it for public dissemination. I start with a half dozen people in a lab all day vetting information. I mean, what are they comparing it against? I mean, one real break in the case happens when a couple staying at an Airbnb trains their camera phone out the window at exactly the right moment to catch a ride service driver parked on a side street nearby, and Sophie is suddenly hacked. That video is released, and everyone, follow me on this, everyone gets it, identifies the car, and then the driver, and he becomes the victim of mob violence, and we meet up with him in the hospital, recovering from his injuries. Responding to the murder of Tanner's daughter, which happened more than a year ago, Sophie users had that level of free time to assault someone who was in no way involved with it. The liability issues on this app would skyrocket, and the man would have a case to take ownership of Tanner's sideshow and shut him down right then and there. Or his family would if he had been murdered. I, they skim right past this with a promise to do better next time, I guess, and hire the hacker, who happens not only to be in the same town, but drives to Sophie Central to claim his new job. He, not surprisingly, has little regard for due process or the danger of greed-fueled vigilantism, and highlights the extended video posted on Sophie, not available before because programmers were lazy and reused code, which I guess they're all supposed to reinvent the wheel each time. In some kind of fig-leaf acknowledgement of this, a technician later asks a Sophie user, walking her dog in the park, if it would be okay to use her phone as a listening device to overhear info from a suspect in a related crime, and all she needs to do is walk a little closer to those two men on that bench over there. Since it's not the main crime, it's a serial date rape murder, not the murder of Jeremy Piven's daughter, uh, there's no payoff for the increased danger she's putting herself in, and Piven then gets upset because Sophie Resources went to solving a crime that was not his daughter's murder. But the crowd is given the guy's picture, and as he moves through a subway station, more people start following him with their phones because the show concludes people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. This time they don't assault him, he's white after all, unlike the ride service driver. Uh, they just monitor the suspect until the police arrive and then all of them applaud while he's taken into custody. People in train stations want to catch trains. People in parks just want to take a nice walk. The idea that a beep on your phone is going to turn you into a crime-fighting superhero is ridiculous. I've got an app on my phone that wants me to buy extra security with every new press release out of Yahoo. Not surprisingly, it's in the business of selling security. 
Sophie Central contacting me with updates about not multi-million dollar payout crimes is not going to get me any more excited about informing on my fellow citizens than any other marketing app. Oh, and that woman in the park should check her end-user licensing agreement. I'm pretty sure downloading and activating the Sophie app allows Sophie Central to turn on her microphone and camera remotely without her consent. Tanner said as much with the line, We gave that up, our expectation of privacy, when we wanted to watch cat videos on our phones. No, we didn't, and no, we haven't, but you probably have done that if you click accept on a crowdsourcing crime-fighting app that you downloaded with some hope of winning a $100 million payout. I mean, they'd only have contacted her to get her to move closer to the conversation they wanted to overhear. The scariest thing about this is not the mob mentality, although that is pretty bad. Last year, Seth Rich, a Democratic staffer, was murdered. It's still unsolved, but a few months ago, reports attributed to a private investigator for the family darkly suggested the motive could have been that he had fed information from the DNC to WikiLeaks, according to Julian Assange. According to an August 16th report by NPR, the investigator does not appear to stand by these statements, and he was bankrolled by a financial advisor in an effort to deflect attention from the Russian election meddling investigation. The danger of a billionaire attempting to uncover, direct, or create evidence through crowdsourcing or by any other means to shift a police investigation in one direction or another is troubling. Personalizing it with a compelling, sympathetic story of a man who has lost his daughter to murder and just wants to uncover the truth doesn't change how troubling that is. Add to the fact that people aren't 100% of the time on their phones and ready to help you with your vanity project and wisdom of the crowd just falls apart. The tech is unreal, the logistical problems insurmountable, and the ethical problems simply endless. It's the Baker Street Irregulars absent Sherlock Holmes. You can delete this app. Or you could if they'd ever bothered to develop it. What I've been watching... Turning to actual comedies, I fell in love with the pilot episode of 9JKL in the opening frame. <laughs> Linda Lavin and Elliot Gould are beaming over little Joshy. Mark Feuerstein, their baby bird, returned to the nest after a starring role in a disastrous television project and also divorce from, as his mother describes her, that cold so-and-so doesn't know a good thing. Joshi is warmly welcomed back into the bosom of his family, his doctor brother married to a pediatrician with 4.8 stars of Yel on Yelp, so his mother must ask, where'd those point two stars go? It's a weird everybody loves Raymond dynamic where mom loves Joshi unconditionally and is more critical of her older, more conventionally successful son. Probably it'll be that Joshi needs the support more. Elliot is the clueless patriarch. Joshi, help me make a viral video! But his connections help get Joshi a bit part in a Paul Feig film, so Joshi gets to experience the good and the bad of having parents without boundaries. And wow, everyone on IMDb logged into crap on this show. I think this show must have stolen their birthdays. To, to read the reviews, you'd think it was the cancelled project his character was fired from, called Blind Cop, which was an of course terrible idea. But it appears everyone in his neighborhood tuned in uh, to tell him it sucked. <laughs> Probably because his mother told them to. <laughs> I think what I'm reacting to is this guy went for his dreams and failed, and his family was there for him, surrounding him with love and support, and that's just such a beautiful thing to see. And I have loved Linda Lavin since for my entire life. This broad family comedy, so very, 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 very Jewish, and oi with the stereotypes, is a cozy little family fantasy nestled in a New York condominium. It's every sitcom ever written. No ground will be broken here, and it will be lucky to last a season if this is the reactions it appears to be getting. But it's so damn cute, I'll watch it for as long as they air it. Plus, it's on CBS, which let the zombie production of Two and a Half Men lurch about for seasons longer than it should have, so I like its odds. Somewhat more innovative was the eighth season return of Bob's Burgers, which drew from fan art submissions to drive some seriously eye-catching animation. 
ranging from simple frames or clips a couple seconds in length to entire chapters fan art at least one of them in claymation drove the episode in which the kids tried to convince bob and linda that they should get a dog the same weekend mr fish Oder's brother felix chose to hide out in the belcher's basement to win their annual hide and seek competition the elder belchers were distracted from all this by trying to offer brunch to compete with jimmy pesto wherein they discovered too late that they needed to enforce a one-meal minimum and water down the mimosas to keep the brunch vultures at bay. I've also been enjoying ABC's Superstore, which, from the writing, seems to have accepted an understanding that it is a deeper, more character-driven piece than your standard sitcom, with the same potential for complexity and development as even The Office. Mateo's falling out with Jeff continues to make for awkwardness in the shop, and Amy and Jonah's relationship appears to be advancing ahead of Amy's divorce, which is kind of what reminded me of Jim and Pam from The Office. Dina's denial over her traumatic experience during the tornado at the end of season two developed into an incredible fallout shelter that could house an entire village for weeks. It's cool to see these characters played against each other for longer-term anecdotal humor than the simple setup gag setup gag setup gag formula. Wow, I've been watching a lot. Kind of the nature of this beast. Let's see, uh, ABC's The Mayor is reasonably funny and worth a look, if only because Vet Nicole Brown is awesome. I also finally got around to watching the season finale of Will on TNT, and to be honest, while the show is quite clever and reasonably well written, it was not especially compelling, especially by the end, where the punk rock groundlings roundly vox pupupulide anti-Catholic firebrand Richard Topcliffe, the spy master heir apparent, destroying his dreams of eradicating all of England of Catholicism with the response to an especially pointed stage presentation of King Richard III. I wanted to watch another episode of Kevin Probably Saves the World before I commented on it, but I think I'll pass. It was okay. A quirky dramatic comedy that follows a down-and-out would-be suicide Kevin back to his astrophysical investigator sister's home to deal with his disaffected niece and the meteor that fell from the sky nearby, and he loaded into his car before it would appear some heavenly emissary connected to it had that car run over by farm equipment in a move to reduce his connection to earthly things. Only he can see this angel, I heavenly emissary who charges him with a mission of finding and saving 36 souls by hugging them i'm not getting involved the guy has attempted suicide he talks to people only he can see he's a jaywalking charge from a rubber room and these shows do not as a rule find satisfying conclusions all the best eli stone 2017 but i won't be coming along for this ride diving into the classic collection I made just a little bit of progress on my classic collection this time. A few more Nip Tuck episodes have been tracking into my view lately, which has been very cool. Sean and Troy moved to Hollywood to basically make fun of it, and in the second episode of the fifth season, the boys work on a pair of Marilyn Monroe impersonators who were best friends until they started competing more head-to-head, -head, and after the surgery, they realize they can do better by working together. Naturally, the episode ends in a three-way with Dr. Troy. Also, I caught a glimpse of myself on a noon show promoting sex farce When the Cat's Away. Seriously fun show. Really loved working with Jess and Eric and Susan on that one. As for the noon show, it was wild to see myself on screen a thousand years and a hundred pounds ago. I sure have been happy to be able to drop some of the weight, that's for sure. Otherwise, not much stands out beyond a 30-second scrap of video on disc 341 that I was initially tempted to submit as Exhibit B in crowdsourcing. 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 Here's the thing, though. I was already able to track it down. The 30 seconds or so scrap of film appears to be from Season 1, Episode 6 of Back to You, titled Grace's Bully, wherein, and this is from the episode summary on Wikipedia, Ada Field as Montana is upstaged by a young weather girl who is able to pronounce Monongahela, and she is not. She gets some help from Josh Gad as Nebish production assistant Ryan Church, and it's basically him trying to coach her to say the word Monongahela over and over again, which is hilarious, and why I kept it, but was not as easy to track down as some of them have been. I was tempted to throw it out to the wisdom of the crowd, but I decided I'd try just a little bit harder myself. 
After a couple of cold runs at it from a couple of different directions, I typed Fox Newsroom Comedies into a search window. That didn't net me much, so I added 2007, which pointed me to a review on a long-defunct MTV news site that referred to a show called Action News. I typed that into TV.com and was redirected to the Kelsey Grammer comedy Back to You. I typed that into IMDb and saw a picture of Josh Gad, who looked very like one of the characters in that exchange. The other character was Ada Field as Montana something or other, and I typed Back to You into Wikipedia, which gave me some surprisingly detailed episode summaries, including one in which Montana has to deal with a precocious young weather girl who upstages her when the young weather girl can successfully pronounce Monongahela River. Provenance tracked with reasonable certainty to the best of my ability and satisfaction. Goal achieved. Current collection. Besides, the big news for this week was for my current collection. After my laser like focus on fall premieres last time, I thought I should try to make a little more headway on this front, and lo and behold, a couple days into my cataloging week before last, I unearthed the eighth and final episode of Legion on FX. While back in episode 7 of this podcast, I determined that once I'd tracked down all the episodes of Legion, I'd be making that my first homemade DVD set. Partly because I was just in love with the art and presentation of that story, partly because with how short that series was, just 8 episodes, it was a manageable project to take on, and partly because I was just hungry to re-experience the show. I used the search function to track the episodes in my catalog listing to discs 12, 14, 16, 21, 28, 32, 36, and 44. I also tracked down an interview Aubrey Plaza gave on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert on disc 17. I hooked my Philips DVD player to Sonia and transferred the titles in real time, and over the course of a Saturday, I crafted a homemade DVD set of eight episodes over two discs, complete with DVD extras. <laughs> I don't think it's the best use of my time, so I don't imagine I'll be doing this very often. I knew it was something I could probably accomplish in theory, so I wanted to be able to see if I could do it in practice. Uh, There's probably faster and easier ways to do it. I suspect I have neurodisc burning software that could transfer the files directly if I could bring them in properly, but just... There seem to be some structural issues to making this kind of a transfer, which... I'm not sure. I think it might actually be how my recorder codes the recordings on the discs. It may be to reduce the potential for piracy, which I should reiterate here. I am recording all of this media for my own personal use. Nothing remotely commercial, I promise. However, this way I was absolutely able to watch the series again while it was transferring, which is part of the stated goal in crafting this homemade DVD set. For the cover art, I grabbed a couple of images and screen caps and knit them together while the episodes were recording. I printed them out and the end result looked not half bad. Suitable for sitting on a shelf being a homemade DVD collection. Achievement unlocked. In other current collection finds, I kept a Prairie Public original profile of Minot artist Walter Peel from 2011 titled Sweetheart of the Rodeo. I tracked Sam and Dean's entry into the Men of Letters bunker in Season 8 of Supernatural. I also saved Melissa McCarthy's first appearance as Sean Spicer on Saturday Night Live, and have been cataloging more episodes of We Bear Bears on the Cartoon Network, a cute little show I absolutely love. Bear Brothers Grizz, Pan Pan, and Ice Bear live in a cave in Northern California and encounter a lot of life, including internet fame, texting and dating, and lots of fun, mostly manageable scrapes. A couple of favorite series of mine wandered back into view this past week, including the third season opener of Better Call Saul and the first couple episodes of Hank Azaria as the uproariously funny Brockmire. I also cataloged the eighth season opener for Archer Dreamland, which, spoiler alert, doesn't, as a season, add a hell of a lot to the series. It's mostly a lot of stylized running about, which I guess the same can be said of Archer Vice in Season 5, but that was reasonably clever, character-driven, could be understood to take place out here in consensus reality, even by the -the over-the-top standards of this show, and built some towering funny. By comparison, Season 8 didn't do a whole lot for me at all, sorry. Finally, heading into this weekend, I cataloged a four-hour block of Canadian animation that Turner Classic Movies aired in April on Now Showing with Ben Mankiewicz, interspersed with interviews with animators Ellen Beeson and Aubrey Mintz. I was able to record all 30 of these animations that they aired, several of which also aired on the Cartoon Network's O Canada program. There were some classic pieces, some quirky pieces, and some absolute rubbish, though 
I'm sure very nice, very nice, probably won some kind of award for being weird for the sake of weird. Standouts included The Log Driver's Waltz, The Cat Came Back, What on Earth, from the Film Board of Mars, a short called E, which discusses perception and filtered reality, My Grandmother Ironed the King's Shirts, which was a fun account of a subversive behavior in Norway during the World War II, and one of my favorites, The Big Snit, wherein a couple hits a rough patch in their Scrabble game, get distracted, start fighting, and need to take a moment to remember what they mean to each other. Also a lot of fun, Bob's Birthday, complete with full frontal nudity, and a delightful piece called Black Fly, which I found myself humming on and off uh, ever since re-encountering it in this collection. (laughs) Fun song. Beyond that, thank you for checking in on my video cataloging project. You can check out my catalog listing along with audio links at videofuzzy.blogspot.com and past episodes of this podcast at Apple Podcasts and videofuzzy.libsyn.com. Feedback is always appreciated. You can contact me through my blog or podcast sites or through my Video Fuzzy page on Facebook. For Video Fuzzy, I'm Terry J. Amon. Happy viewing. It might be amazing. It might just be scuzzy. We'll find out together on Video Fuzzy.